Last time we were here in Ubin at night, we explored its forest and found many of its incredible inhabitants. This time round, we are heading to a very special and precious area known as Chik Jawa, which was successfully deferred from reclamation back in 2001. It's another episode of Marine Treasure Hunt! Let's go! Hi, it is Jordan! So Jordan here from MParks will be joining us today because the intertidal zone at Chik Jawa is actually a restricted area which you guys can visit by joining MParks public guided tours. So today we'll be taking the island van, uh, but normally you can also either walk there or cycle all the way. Bye bye, it's an adventure! It's a real bumpy ride. Whee! Oh my goodness, it's dark. Sisi Uncle. Chik Jawa is believed to be named after a man from Java who used to live around the area. With the word Chik either referring to Machik or Encik, and the word Jawa referring to the Indonesian island of Java. There's a wobble there walking. Go, Jonathan. Ah, oh, yay! Let's clap. Chik Jawa is a unique area that cannot be found on the mainland. And before I reveal why, here's a little context. There are several types of ecosystems that you can find along the coast, such as sandy shores, seagrass meadows, rocky shores, coral rubble, mud flats, mangroves, and coastal forests. For the previous beaches we have explored, Changi Beach is a sandy shore with a few seagrass patches, Sentosa's Tanjung Rimau is a rocky shore that leads to a coral rubber ecosystem, while you can find mangroves in the muddy areas of Pasiris Park. So you will realise that there's usually two to three ecosystems at each of these places. But here at Magical Chick Jawa, you can actually spot all seven of them when you look around carefully. We are going to head all the way out, as close to the sea as possible, and this will lead us to the coral rubble. Okay, so one of the distinctive features that makes the coral rubble different is that there's a lot more hard substrate, right? And mm. you also have more reefy organisms like your sponges. It got, it got synthetic, synthetic. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, this is quite a long one. So on mainland, the ones that I typically find is this small purple ones, and they are usually on washed up sponges, like because I mean you don't really get to have like coral rubble area back on mainland is. Yeah, so I don't get to see this really big cyanetic sea cucumber. Oh, then there's the long black sea cucumber. Long and black, like, it's quite distinctive. And we saw it in Sentosa and Hantu, where there are coral rubbles around us. Yeah, it's actually camouflaged here. So I could only tell when the water keeps rippling and then when you see the siphon openings and then you recognise the eyes. That's where I know an octopus is hiding here. Hey, come over, come over. There's a huge bear flatworm here. Okay. It's a flatworm! This is a beautiful sea fan. As you can see, it's really huge. And they're actually under the same group of animals together along with the sea anemones. So you can actually see the individual polyps that comes out when the sea fan is submerged in the water. There's a lot of things around me. I'm a bit overwhelmed by what I'm seeing. It's Hello! You're so cute! You must have lived a long life! <laughs> it's an injured fish. Ah, oh, how you recover soon? Hopefully, right? It doesn't look too bad. I think it's a cast fish. Cast fish. The coral rubble provides a firm surface for a lot of the animals to grow and seek shelter without the constant crashing of the waves. So many of the more delicate animals here that prefers to be submerged in the water will tend to seek refuge here instead. And also, this often leads into a subtidal coral reef deeper down the sea, which is a whole other ecosystem altogether. After this, you see grass. Okay, let go. As we slowly move closer to the shore, we'll find ourselves on top of a seagrass meadow. We only allow people down on the intertidal here on guided walks because we want to prevent over-trampling of the many fragile animals that live here. We found an onnit leaf slug and they are really cool animals because they can steal the chloroplast from the algae that they eat and use it for themselves to make food through photosynthesis. So they are like nature's own solar-powered animals. This is the seagrass meadow and it looks very rich as though there's a lot of food but actually most animals here don't eat the seagrass itself. They eat the seaweed that grows uh, amongst or on the seagrass leaves. You know what is seagrass? The sea cow. Moo! Mm. Uh, the, the carpet anemone is eating a horseshoe crab, uh, fully engulfing it already. Yeah. So they have a mouth in the middle and this is my first time seeing a horseshoe crab which is really, really, really crazy. He's so cute. He's a tiny sea urchin. He's a tiny star. Okay, so generally in the seagrass meadow, that's the nursery for fish, for crabs, where they will find shelter when they're young. So that's why we are seeing a lot of baby things, right? We see uh, baby horseshoe crabs, we see baby flower crabs, like these two here. That's why seagrass meadows are very important to conserve because a lot of the seafood that uh, we eat 
they actually rely on these seagrass meadows as the nursery and only when they become adults then they move out to the open sea where we uh, tend to catch them. We move on to the rocky shore. Let's go! Now we are heading towards a rocky shore, one of the last few places with a natural rocky shore in Singapore. So a lot of the animals here either have a tough outer shell or a leathery body that protects the animal from drying out under the sun when the tide recedes. They can also use the tiny holes and crevices within the rocks as shelter. Oh, okay, so if you see over there, there are quite a few wild boar footprints. Yeah! Tuk, 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 tuk. So the interdial oh. zone isn't a place just for marine animals. A lot of land animals also depend on it for food. Wild boars will come down to dig into the mud flat, looking for worms and clams. Oh, wow! Uh, sometimes you also have birds, like the great bill heron, which is our tallest bird. Uh, it also relies on intertidal flats for catching fish. So we're heading to the sandy beach next where we're going to find perhaps more familiar animals. So this is our gong gong, also known as the pearl corn snail, buried in its natural environment, the sandbar. The sandy shore may look bare and empty, but the decaying matter and plankton that are found within the sand particles are actually a major food source for a lot of the animals. So we will be looking out for some sand dwellers here who are burrowing underground to avoid drying out under the sun and also hopefully find some of the shorebirds that are foraging out there. Yes, we can see the tiny little balls of sand here and they are all made by the tiny sand bubble crab because they do eat the tiny edible bits that are found within the sand particles. Swallow whatever they can swallow and then they will bleh out of the sand into a, like, a tiny ball and they will throw it out. The sand star, they live on the sandy shore and you can see it's actually thinner, flatter and they can move very quickly and they have tiny spines on its body and also the cute bits, they are very flexible so they can burrow easily into the sand. So when sand dollars dies, their tiny little hairs fall off and then you can see the pattern of the sand dollars. It's actually very pretty. It feels like concrete, it feels very different also. So the tide is coming back in, we're going to head back towards the shore, but we're going to visit the mangrove ecosystem next. The mangrove ecosystem consists of many interesting plants and animals that have adapted to the muddy and low oxygen environment. Some of the trees here have air breathing roots that not only provide oxygen to the muddy surroundings but also act as a buffer to protect our shores from coastal damage. It is also an important nursery ground for young fishes and other wildlife to seek food and shelter. This is a mangrove propagule growing on a tree, aka the seedling. So because the mangrove plants live in a tough environment, the mother plant will actually best a bit more energy and time to grow the seedling first and then the seedling will drop and hopefully float to a suitable location where it will grow into a new plant. You see? The shell of the horseshoe crab. Mangrove horseshoe crab. So it's a different one. Can you see the tail? It's actually rounded here. The boardwalk leads you into the mangrove area where you can get closer to the mangrove flora and also interesting fauna such as your fiddler crabs, your mudskippers and also your horseshoe crabs. <sighs> oh, that's a lot. Eh? Oh my god. It's a bit too many. Eh? Oh. Oh. We're here! You okay? He's a man of a few words. I don't know about her. If you take a look at the coastline area, you will find that the forest here is a bit different as compared to the forest you can find inland. Also, our coastal forests here harbour endangered species such as the Delic Ayer and the Seashot Nutmeg. So over the last 15 years, we've constructed uh, quite a lot of new facilities here such as the boardwalk, the business centre of the viewing jetty and this very tower we're standing on. So before all these facilities were built, people could only visit Chek Jawa on guided intertidal walks, which we still continue to do today. But as Singapore transforms into a city in nature, where nature is an integral part of everyone's life, uh, people can now visit here and get up close to the habitats we saw earlier in a way that minimises the impact on our rich biodiversity. All the animals that we saw earlier, the plants, uh, these are part of the natural heritage of all Singaporeans. Mm -hmm. right? So it's important that everyone uh, learns more about them so that we can better conserve them for our future generations. Interestingly, Chek Jawa was not widely known to the public until the early 2000s and even then, it was actually initially slated for reclamation. But thankfully, with the combined efforts of our local nature enthusiasts and the authorities, Chek Jawa has been successfully conserved for all of us to enjoy. And being able to step into this intertidal zone that has been touted as one of the most special zones in Singapore is really an experience that I will never forget. Thank you so much, Jonathan, for bringing us around today and I hope you guys have enjoyed today's special episode of Marine Treasure Hunt. So let us know where you would like us to explore next. That's all for today. Just keep thinking. <laughs>